<clears throat> Today I want to talk to you about prayer, uh, specifically what we call the Lord's Prayer. Um, it, it probably is better titled the Disciples' Prayer. But before I do that, I, I want to frame up my message with an illustration from running a marathon. And I also want to do it with using that passage that I used earlier in the summer with you from uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll get there in a moment. And we'll get back to Matthew 6 in several moments. So hang with me. This is a little bit of a, a lengthy introduction because I just want to help us kind of think through this prayer um, not necessarily a little bit differently, but kind of invite you into my world a little bit as to how God's been working on me, thinking through the disciples or the Lord's Prayer. So first, let's go with the marathon illustration. There's someone online named Sabrina, and she has a very popular running blog called Running Brina. I just stumbled upon this. It was very informative. Now, I'm sure there's countless other blogs like this, but this one caught my eye because it rang somewhat familiar since I was born in the town of Chicago. One of her recent entries gives you some detailed information on what to expect if you're going to run the Chicago Marathon. And I love information like this because it gives kind of a, uh, a macro or a big picture, and I like that. Uh, but it also kind of dives in um, with a micro, more of a small picture perspective. And since I think I may have told you this before at my last message, I drive a truck for a living. And I finally find it incredibly helpful to know the big picture. I want to know how many miles it's going to take for my route that day or the time it's going to take to get there. You know, and, 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 and I just like maps anyway, so I like to see where I'm going to. But I also like to see the smaller picture because I need to fuel up my truck and I need to eat along the way. And I want to see some fun, interesting places and attractions that I can kind of pull over and read. I like historical markers. Who, who likes historical markers? I, I love reading those things. A lot of the time in a big truck, I can't pull over to do that. But if I can, I will read both sides uh, because I just, uh, things like that are fascinating to me. But back to the Chicago Marathon. Here are some of Sabrina's own words. And she says this about the Chicago Marathon. She says, The spectators in Chicago are great, and they're massive. And for the first 13 miles of the race, which is why a lot of, runner, a lot of runners have way faster first halves than their second halves, it's definitely difficult not to feed off such an energetic crowd. If it's possible, make sure you save your energy and take it slow. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. The blog also goes on with some specific tips along the way, especially some unique landmarks. If you've ever been to Chicago, there's the Water Tower and the Sears Tower, you know, just some things that people would recognize. So she goes into a bit of detail about the terrain. It's flat. If you've ever been to Chicago, it's flat the whole way. But she goes on, she says this, mile 20 marks a common point of time where many racers hit the wall and crash. And this is your time to shine. Only six miles left. Find your faster groove and take this marathon home. Keep your mind engaged. Don't forget you're almost there. And she goes on, she says, also the Willis Tower will be getting closer and closer. Almost at the finish line, you'll make a right turn, another left, and there she is, the finish line. Don't forget to smile and enjoy the moment. This is all yours. You've worked so hard to come this far, and you've conquered the course of the Chicago Marathon. Now, this is where Hebrews 12 gets in, and if you, if you want to turn there and keep your finger to Matthew 6, I see Hebrews 12 all over this passage. Um, it's, it's kind of this, this macro big picture that the writer of Hebrews gives, but he begins to allude to a smaller picture that I believe Matthew 6 is going to help us with, specifically in the area of prayer. <clears throat> now, a couple of months ago, I brought a message on Matthew 6, uh, also near the end of the chapter. It talks about not being anxious. And if you remember, I used the same passage to kind of uh, outline the talk. I felt it was just a great way to give an, uh, you know, a mental outline to our thoughts on anxiousness and worry. Kind of this 
this this macro big picture in this micro big pic or micro smaller picture. Today I want to do something a little similar. So bear with me. Let me read uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 again, just to refresh our memories. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners in such hostility against himself that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. I picked that passage for the anxiousness talk because of those words near the end there, weary and faint-hearted, but I think they kind of help us today in regard to prayer. Now, to me... And you may disagree, but to me, this, paints, this passage does paint a picture of a marathon, kind of like what Sabrina's doing with her blog, but more, hers is just more from a worldly perspective. In a sense, you have a crowd of witnesses that surround those who are running, and you have a race with obstacles and opportunities set before each runner, and you have a finish line to look forward to and toward. Now, think more specifically about these phrases in Hebrews in relation to prayer, as we seek to take this kind of this big picture macro marathon race into micro as we think about prayer. Okay, I don't want to be confusing with this, but I'm, like I said, I'm inviting you into my study and how I kind of am processing and thinking through things. And this has just been incredibly helpful for me. So let's look at the phrase, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Think about this, that those who have run the course of life before, and they're alluded to in Hebrews chapter 11, have done it by faith, okay? They did this imperfectly, just like the saints of old and the church today, just like you and me, we're all in this kind of together. But look to their example as a helpful guide in our journey as well. And in regard to prayer, we have this rich treasure chest uh, before us in Scripture, the Psalms specifically, you know they, they are. They're geared toward uh, cheering us on in prayer, encouraging us in our faith, sympathizing with us in our pain, lifting us up to our Heavenly Father's right, rightful focus of all our prayers. We're, we're surrounded by these witnesses and their witness. And you can read that more specifically in chapter 11 of Hebrews. Um, now, this next phrase that I want to focus on in that in Hebrews passage there is, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which, so, which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, these witnesses that we're talking about in, from Hebrews 11 stand with us in the context of a race, this, this macro or big picture of life from, from birth to to death. But it's important to note that none of us live the same kind of life that anyone else lives. For each of us, something different is set before us. Therefore, prayer can become very personal and life-giving in much the same way like a cup of cold water can give in a marathon. You know, they have those, a lot of the time they'll have tables set up, there's Gatorade, there's, there's water, and it could be like that. Um, You can get that picture in your mind. But it also, prayer can also be a a marker or a signpost along the way to kind of give direction and perspective and purpose in our life. And then this last phrase I want to focus on in Hebrews before we springboard into Matthew is looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. In a sense... Jesus is the finish line. At our church, and I go to Providence Community Church, our pastor, Paul, he often closes the service with the phrase, Lord Jesus, and, and then we know what's coming next. Come quickly. Did you, were you thinking about that? Lord Jesus, come quickly. It's based on Revelation 22.20. 20. And all of us would, would concur with that statement because the best is yet to come, right? 
come quickly. Oh, I find myself saying that more and more throughout the week. But another very important sense, Jesus is with us every step of the race. He's intimately involved in our lives. He, he promised that he'll never leave us or forsake us at any point in our journey, life journey. And because he's the founder and perfecter of our faith, it really would be unwise not to take heed, especially when asked by one of his disciples, and, he, and Luke 11 is kind of a parallel to this passage, but we won't look specifically at, at Luke, uh, except for the, the phrase that the disciples uttered. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. <laughs> this is where the macro, the big picture, meets the micro on a profound level. This big picture shines light and clarity, I think, on Matthew 6 in a way that is like getting this cup of cold water or Gatorade or whatever on a race course. Or, or it's like um, having a clearer vision to see the markers and signs along the route to help, like I said, with perspective and purpose. Because if you're like me, it's very, very I can't use enough varies, <laughs> very easy to hit the wall and miss or forget what life should be about. Are you with me on this? Am I, am I, are you resonating with this? Am I preaching to you? Amen. Any amens? You with me? Good. So I don't want to miss the purpose of the race. Okay. Matthew 6 remind us of, uh, reminds us how to hold on to the important things when circumstances, people and relationships, health, whatever, it goes sideways, all right? So for our purposes this morning, I'm gonna break this prayer, prayer down. So turn back to Matthew 6 from Hebrews. You'll notice that throughout the rest of my talk, I will use a little bit of that Hebrews 12 terminology. So that's intentional, okay? But I wanna break this prayer down specifically, um, verses 9 through 13 is where we're going to zero in, okay? And we're going to look at these smaller pieces. And to use my marathon illustration, hopefully one last time, um, think of these markers along, as, as markers along our route, okay? I'm going to include a brief thought about each of these markers, each of these phrases, and then I'm going to pray at the end of it. So we're going to have at least six prayers within the body of this message. Just give you a heads up of where we are heading next. Before I do that, get a little drink of water. A cup of cold water is always good, isn't it? <clears throat> Let me remind us of this prayer. I know I'm, I know I read more than what we're focusing in on, but I want, kind of wanted to get in the context. But we're specifically going to start at verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us, oops, sorry, I lost my place. And forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. First phrase, our Father in heaven. <clears throat> we direct our prayers toward a heavenly Father. So I thought about that, not just this week, but I've been preparing this message for weeks. The implications of this really are staggering, if you think about it. The God of the universe wants to be addressed as Father. It should never be lost on us that Jesus himself refers to God as his Father as well, with several times even calling him his Heavenly Father. There's Ten times alone in the Sermon on the Mount that he uses that phrase. 
If you're looking for key words throughout books and what the main point that the writer's trying to convey, that should, be a, that should go off in your head. It went off in mine. Now, it must be clearly understood that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has secured for us the privilege, um, this privilege of, that we can call him our you know, heavenly father, because we're his sons and daughters now. And even though this is truly a place of extreme honor, we cannot lose sight of the fact that our Father is to be worshipped. There is a greatness with God, even as Father, that transcends everything else, including us. He is set apart. Pray with me. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have adopted adopted us through Christ into the family of faith. And as we run the race set before us, help us to never forget that we are never alone. We've been placed in the family of faith who have experienced your great love and care and thousands of blessings. We praise you and thank you today because you have made us your children because of Christ. Amen. Second thing, hallowed be your name. Now, a lot of us know this already, and I, and I know you've covered this prayer before, I'm sure, in a message and done some reading. So you've got a lot of familiar, familiarity with this. But the word hallowed does mean holy. It means consecrated. It means greatly revered or honored. And the whole Bible reflects this. And I can put several psalms down in passages, and if you want those passages, you you can see that, that David even consistently affirms it, if not clearly, calling God holy. And he and that's not even to mention all the times that God is connected to holy places, he has a holy throne, he has a holy hill, a holy house. It's all over the Bible. Specifically you'll see it in, in the Psalms. This God we approach is above all else in this world. He's above all things. He's above all people, events, everything. He is set apart from us so much so that we cannot quite understand the implications of all this and what this means. But suffice it to say, we approach God in prayer in the fullness of his holiness. He alone is worthy to be set apart as such, and he alone is worthy to hear our prayers and to even do something about it. And our Heavenly Father is not a distant, absentee parent. He's present as our perfect advocate, the person of Jesus Christ. And we look to him as the founder and perfecter of our faith in all matters of life, specifically the matters of prayer. Pray with me. Lord, we're humbled. We are truly humbled as we approach you this morning because you alone are God. And we can think about that many times over and just do messages upon messages there. But we're equally humbled that you have allowed us to approach you as our Heavenly Father. That's what a gift. What a gift, Lord. What an extreme blessing that we should never take for granted. And because of Christ's righteousness, you have given us the gift to even even be able to approach you in your holiness. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Millions of times over, thank you. In Christ's name, amen. I thought about doing messages on each one of these, but you would have been here all day long. I would have fun. I don't know about you, though. (laughs) Third phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, think about your lives for a moment, because if you're like me, and I know you are, they're, they're full of agendas, and it's extremely difficult at times to ascertain a direction to take. Uh a cause to live for, or even just decisions to land on. 
Amen on that. Uh, just so many things. You know, they just hit us all day long. But overarching all of that should be an increasing desire to make God's agendas, God's agenda ours, even in these uncertainties of life. Luke 9.23 breaks through and says, issues this t- as a call to all of us. Luke says, deny yourself and take up his cross and follow me. God's kingdom and will are too big of subjects to tackle for this message, but set in the context of our marathon, it's, it's important to always consider this call in the race set before us. Think about this. God has uniquely gifted and called us as individuals and as a church to live and breathe in the society and world before us. We're, we're supposed to live here, okay? We're supposed to be a part of this world. Some will be given the responsibility to, to move, and some will shake, while others are going to quietly serve in the background, all the while moving toward the end of history when Christ comes back. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, lead us by your Holy Spirit to deny ourselves daily, to take up our cross and the responsibilities you've given each of us, the unique race set before each of us, and to follow you. Help us to model our faith after the founder and perfecter of of our faith, Jesus. Create in us a joy in the journey that your kingdom and your will are the only true things to live and to die for. In Jesus' name, amen. Fourth phrase, give us this day our daily bread. Now, in light of all that we've discussed and prayed for so far, it would seem that the issue of our needs is pretty much farther down the list of importance in God's eyes, you know? What is this giving of daily bread but a selfish request for meeting my needs? We must be very careful here in our understanding of, of, this, of the importance of this request. For one, isn't the meeting of our needs important only if to give us the sustenance and strength to bring in God's kingdom and live out his will? At least that should be, right? We're only mere humans after all, need to eat. But in a more intimate sense, the meeting of needs by our Heavenly Father is an, act, is an act of great care and concern. He indeed, he indeed cares about all of our lives. And it's not just for his own purposes. He doesn't keep us well fed just to be able to move us to the front lines and continue in the battle. Just get back in there. Okay? But this, this connotation also of bread brings with it an everyday quality of life. That covers so much more than food. It, it, you think about shelter, you think about your health, you think about clothing, all of which a loving earthly father has taken on or should take on the responsibility to provide for his children. So much more so that a heavenly father should think about such things. But it also points to Christ, the one who would offer his body for all of us on the cross and that which is symbolized by the bread and the Lord's Supper. This sacrifice would meet our ultimate need, eternal life with our Heavenly Father. Praise God for that. What a picture that we have. I wish we were doing Lord's Supper this morning. This would have sprung into that very well. Pray with me in regard to this. Heavenly Father, thank you for meeting our needs each and every day. Whether we ask for, whether we ask for it or not, you are so generous, even when we are unaware of the blessings you have provided all around us. Give us a heart of gratitude, not only for the earthly bread you daily give, but the bread of life, who freely offered himself up for us. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Fifth phrase in our Lord's Prayer, Disciples' Prayer. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
The word debt, it's defined as something owed or due. And I'm going to let J.I. Packer cover some ground here. And I, I found it very helpful in reading through. He's got a real small booklet. I meant to bring it with me. It's called Praying the Lord's Prayer. And it offers up some direction in regard to this. He says this. <clears throat> Jesus' thought is that we owe God total, tireless loyalty. Zealous love for God and man all day and every day on the pattern of Jesus' own. And our sin is basically failure to pay. Say that one more time. This is a short phrase. I won't repeat any of the others that he says, but this is important. Jesus' thought is that we owe God total, tireless loyalty. Zealous love for God and man all day and every day on the pattern of Jesus' own. And our sin basically is failure to pay. Now, Packer clarifies. He says, if Christ's death atoned for all sins, past, present, and future... Why need, the, why need the Christian mention his daily sins to God at all? The answer lies in distinguishing between God as judge and as father, and between being a justified sinner and an adopted son. The Lord's Prayer is a family prayer in which God's adopted children address their father, and though their daily failure, failures do not overthrow their justification, never forget that, Things will not be right between them and their father till they have said sorry and asked him to overlook the ways they have let him down. Unless Christians come to God each time as returning prodigals, their prayer will be as unreal as that of the Pharisees in Jesus' parable. Wow. He continues, Those who live by God's forgiveness must imitate it. One whose only hope is that God will not hold his faults against him forfeits his right to hold others' faults against them. Oh, that's powerful stuff. That one chapter in the book is well worth you getting, investing in it. Just the, the powerful pieces that Packer gives in just a short burst. Very convicting. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, our sin debt is so deep and wide and heavy and it clings so closely to us that sometimes we can't see through it all. But thanks be to Christ that your love for us is deeper and wider and stronger still. Lead us to repent of our daily sins and in the process lead us to forgive others of their sins against us. In Jesus' name, amen. The final sixth phrase in this prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I know I can get a lot of amens on this, but you agree with me that life is hard. Life is hard. Gosh, it's hard. It's full of battles. It's full of testing. It, there's traps around every corner. There's sickness. There's pressures. Weakness. Oh, I was working in the yard yesterday, and I used to do a lot more gardening than I do. But the ground is so much harder than it used to be, just trying to put a shovel in it. Weaknesses. Life is full of that. It's got headaches. It's got troubles of all kinds. You've got stories galore, I'm sure. But think about it in this regard. Temptations to sin and abandon God are all around in these things. And for this, we need protection and deliverance. A marathon, a marathon has obstacles as well. And the blog I referred to above from Sabrina offers advice on how to run the Chicago Marathon. And it would be extremely unwise, uh, it, it would be extremely wise, excuse me, to listen to her advice, especially if you don't know Chicago or you don't know the lay of the land. She's gone on before, and done some of the hard work for us. Now, our great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews is talking about offer, also offers counsel, which would be wise to heed. Of course, they were imperfect like us, <clears throat> but they were commended for their lives because they walked by faith.
faith. And that's all what we're seeking to do. Packer brings this caution. He says, uh, he says this. Life is a spiritual minefield. Amid such dangers, we dare not trust ourselves. Father, keep us safe. We're never in a safe place where we can rest because danger abounds everywhere and at all times. Sorry, folks. It's just the way it is. So this capstone to our prayer brings the reality of life in full view, and we must never forget it. Pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to be strong in you and in the strength of your might. Remind remind us, Lord, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Protect and deliver us from ourselves, each other, and the evil one who is out to destroy your kingdom and your will. Make us more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, let me wrap this up. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, those three verses, have really become a very helpful outline or a frame of my thoughts as, I'm, as I just seek to add, navigate well through life. I, I hope this picture helps you as well. You know, we're, we're all running this race together as God's church, and we're surrounded by saints of old, um, and we have saints today, and all these can teach us much on prayer. But most specifically, we need to learn from Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. His prayer for all his disciples is ours as well. And these words offer abundant life. This cup of cold water on our journey through life. So this morning, I want to conclude with a couple questions. For you to consider. Okay. First one. What is the race. That your heavenly father has set before you. And are you. Are you using specifically. This disciples. This Lord's prayer to help. Guide you. On the course. Now my prayer for you. And my prayer for me. Because this is. This is my struggle as well, is that these words have encouraged us this morning to push past whatever walls you have that are before you and and drink deeply from this life-giving text. They're simple words. They're very simple words. They're not hard to understand. Um, But sometimes they're hard to kind of think through and implement into our lives. Next question for maybe some of you, some others to consider. Do you even know the founder and perfecter of this race that we're speaking about this morning? Maybe today all of this is new, um, but you feel a pull to make some kind of decision. Now, let me be as direct as possible with you this morning. You're already in a race. But it's the one that's going to the wrong finish line. Hell. Now, no one wants to think about such matters today. Nobody wants to talk about these things. But it's a reality that Scripture continually warns about. So here's the deal. I want you to take my word for it this morning as you think about that question for yourself. I want you to listen to these Scriptures and do your business with God. We're going to have a moment where... um, We'll play some music and I'll stand up front. You can uh, talk with me. But think through these scriptures for your own self. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then there's this. Romans 6.23 The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen on that, isn't it? Amen. What a great gift. Let's pray and then we'll have an invitation.